well as um, uh, as well as obviously uh, a psychiatrist. And I'm really looking forward to what he has to say this evening. This is a familiar subject to some of us, at least, um, but it's a very um, pertinent subject for the moment, of course. And so um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome Ron Smith, who's going to speak to us this evening. Welcome, Ron. Thank you. first awareness. I, I just love it. <laughs> what am I doing here? Why wasn't I coming forward? <laughs> I don't know if any of you can identify with that. <laughs> I, I also love this. Wittgenstein, this is G. Moore to Bertrand Russell. Wittgenstein was the only man who looked puzzled at his own life. <laughs> so this I think very highly of. <laughs> recognize a couple of people in here. There's two naval administrations over here. Uh, Senator Larry Pressler back there who left a Rhodes Scholarship to go to Vietnam. <laughs> Bob Keston, Senator Bob Keston, who every year put a bill forward for national service. Admiral Jenkins here. I, I will leave some out, but Kiki, I have to say something about Kiki. Kiki is married to my roommate at the Naval Academy. Class of 1966, Dave Bill, who ended up the last commanding officer of our biggest battleship, uh, Admiral Dave Bill. And I love him and I miss him. And we got to get together for a little while. So I just wanted to go around. I'll, I'll let, there's one of the smartest guys in the world, Pat, and his beautiful wife, Nancy, back and go around for a while. And I'll, I'll leave some out that was just. Y'all, I love psychiatry and I love things that can be put on a three by five card. And, and Yalom is probably my favorite analyst. And he says that people who go through the aggravation of picking up the phone and call in an analyst, or perhaps coming to church or talking to Father Tim or Tiffany, are trying to avoid one of four truths, which is too painful to bear by yourself. One is you're really alone in the universe. Tennessee Williams said we're all condemned to a life of solitary confinement in our skin. Two is we're really going to die. That has been brought to the surface in this culture. And we see it every day on TV. That's not a theory anymore. And the denial of it is crushed. Three is that it's all pretty meaningless. A hundred years from now, next week, what we said in here won't matter. But the fourth one's a tough one. We're responsible to deal with your love three. And that, I think, you'll see how war and religion, spiritual journey, solve both of those problems, sadly. And we'll, we'll talk about love and death and Freud and, and meaning and denial of death. Let's not spend too much. Most of us are born into a meta-narrative. We're born into a world that has a certain given. 
I'm a product of a young Marine going off to fight in Japan and a 16-year-old mama who had the courage to get pregnant. That was World War II. And my first memory is my mama going off to the uh, ammunition plant in Addison, Alabama, putting, putting together ammunition. So we're born, this is given karma. Uh, and you can go back to the Tro The whole of Western civilization really begins with the Iliad and the Trojan War, and then the Crusades, and then the War of 1812 and Civil War, and I'm leaving most of them out. But always, war has been here. And if we don't have a real war, we'll make a cold war. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes, and I'll try to get these related, it's time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. Cormac McCarthy, I, I think this is the most stunning. It makes no difference what men think of war, war endures. May as well ask men what they think of stone. War was always here. Before man was, war waited for him. <laughs> the ultimate trade awaiting its ultimate practitioner. And God, do we see that today? We turn on the TV. The ultimate. Now, this is what Putin has followed, and this is what you get down at Quantico, and this is what we got at the Naval Academy. I'm not saying it's right or it's wrong, but this was the linchpin, and I hate long slides. We do death by uh, PowerPoint at the Pentagon with these guys. <laughs> but forgive me for a minute, and let's do read this. War, this is Clausewitz. War is an act of force. There's no logical limit in the application of force. Attached to force are certain self-imposed imperceptible limitations hardly worth mentioning, known as international law and custom, but they scarcely weaken in fact, kind-hearted people might think there is some ingenious way to disarm or defeat an enemy without bloodshed, and might imagine that the true goal of act, and this is the true goal of the act of war. Pleasant as it sounds, it is a fallacy that must be exposed. War is such a dangerous business that the mistakes which come from kindness are the very worst. Now that's the war. That's what achieved, and that's what Putin believes, and that's what uh, most of our want to teach us that. This is what is the result of that, and you've seen it. There's a, you know, you make an argument whether there's a devil up in Val, but in, in Faust, in, in, it's Mephistopheles is, is talking to Dr. Faust. And Dr. Faust says, but what, who are you? What are you doing? And Mephistopheles says, I am the force that negates. And that's as good a definition of the devil or evil as I can come up with. He knew the essence of war is violence and moderation in war is imbecility. Merton has saved me more than most, perhaps, because he has things like this. I, I just love that people will have different. Prayer and love are learned in the hour where prayer becomes impossible and the heart is turned to stones. That's when we're the most genuinely religious, Merton said. That's when we really reach out. And I wanted to share this. This is the AA meeting, the new AA meeting, Wednesday in Kiev. It's an English speaking meeting. It's still going on. There were a thousand people there last week. Only the Ukrainians spoke. And the subject of the AA meeting was prayer for Russia and prayer for the Ukrainians. And that, I think, is as good a response as we can have as spiritual people on the journey. We're here, we're not going to get out of it. Putin's not going to turn around, but let's pray for him. And that was so stunning to me. There was a thousand people on the meeting on Zoom that you could zoom in. You didn't have to be an alcoholic to zoom in. I was, I was impressed with that. And you can, I won't read the whole thing. And then Merton in Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. And Merton and Karl Barth kind of come together. Uh, 
after seeing World War I and World War II, saying, what have we done as Christians to remain so silent? And this is one of the things Murray says, instead of hating the people you think are war mongers, hate the appetites and disorder in your own soul, which are the cause of war. If you love peace, hate injustice, hate tyranny, hate greed, but hate these things in yourself, not in another. And that's what the Kiev was talking about. That's what the 12 steps come from the book of James, and, and I, I won't go through them here. The Battle of Jericho. Now this is total destruction. What happened there? Joshua went in and he killed everybody in Jericho, and all the sheep and all the lambs and all the children. So this is not new. Armored Christian soldiers, this is Pope Urban II, I think, our first uh, crusade. God wills it. In the siege of Jerusalem, 1099, the crusaders went in and killed everybody in Jerusalem. Every Muslim and everybody that lived there. So this is what Merton's saying is we've got to look at ourselves. We see it now and we blame Putin. We say he's a monster, which is all true from my standpoint. But it's in all of us. And the reason it is is that Neanderthal that could come out of that cave and scan the environment quickly and see the person to kill and the woman to impregnate. They're the ones that are in this room. It's in all of us. Those are the survivors. And it's in all of us. Let's see. This is Clausewitz, total war. This is Dresden, the firebombing of Dresden. There wasn't any equipment in Dresden. It was to destroy the will of the people to continue to fight. The firebombing of Tokyo, it was to destroy the will of the people to continue to fight. That's what Putin's doing now that horrifies us. And I'm not saying that it was the wrong thing to do, and certainly dropping uh, the bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima that saved uh, six million lives at best, probably. Uh, Truman said that night he went to bed and said, what did you worry about? He said, I slept like a baby. You can make decisions like that. And they have to be made. This is another Barth. Barth is part of those Christian existentialists that, that the journey, he was Swiss, but there was a lot of Germans and I won't go into the names because I don't remember most of them, but they got together and they said, what's happened? An individual is genuinely religious, Barth seems to exist, when he's most forlorn, despairing of every possibility of truth, estranged from all value and meaning, lost in a condition of shadowing confusion from whence he can never escape. And that probably says more about me than Barth, because I like that. But certainly I've been there. This is also from the theology of Christ. It's most of the thinkers loosely grouped together under the title Christian existentialists stress that the loss of meaning and confidence in one's life is the basis or at least the beginning of authentic spiritual experience. And that is what can happen from more if we get a bit of this. If you're in Kiev today, I don't know how you have any hope. And what Barth said is that you can choose. He says faith is I am cold or a vacuum. And you can choose to have faith when there's no evidence to have faith. That I love. Here, this is Tom, Mark Twain. If you don't read the newspapers, you're uninformed. If you read the newspapers, you're misinformed. <laughs> <laughs> this is Freud's response to, Albert Einstein actually wrote the first letter, and I've got his book in here. It's a general principle that conflicts of interest between men are settled by the use of violence. This is true of the whole animal kingdom from which we have no business to exclude themselves. And then this men of God and men of war have strange affinities. That's the tough one. Then Einstein says, you've shown irresistible lucidity how insufferable the aggressive and destructive instincts are bound up in the human psyche. 
with those of love and the lust for life. The human race as such will cease to exist unless a world government capable of enforcing world law is established by peaceful means. Only in this way can war be averted. The choice is indeed one between one world or none. Now these guys were writing, where did they try to solve that? Right up the street. The Treaty of Van Barton Hope. That's where the United Nations was put together. That was the theory. That was what, and if you want, Einstein's a lot better than Freud on it. I've got his book if you want to see. Uh, they failed. Why did they fail? Uh oh. Because of this, I think, what is a nation? A sense of oneness, a sense, distinct culture, a sense of superiority, a deep history, sacred territory, sovereignty. We're not about to turn our life and our will and our troops over to the General Council of the United Nations. I don't know the solution for that, but I do agree that Einstein was right. Until we're willing and able to do that, we're going to be fighting until all Asian nations are willing to say, hey, you make the decisions, we'll abide by. And they tried to do it right up the street at Dumbarton Road. So please go up there because so much was done there. And, and they tried, and in, in a way, it kind of worked in Korea and kind of didn't. I, I wondered and thought about this in the first case. He said, if they had come out for peace, take them alive. If they had come out for war, take them alive. I wonder what would have happened if Ukraine had opened the doors. Have you thought about that? I mean, could it have been any worse? Is it time to hang it up? I don't know. I bring that question to you. Now, this is why you can't do it. This is, and if you read Gandhi the Man, I'm, I'm a real. Gandhi, I, I just love him. It's, and East Warren's book, Gandhi the Man, is fantastic. This is what he told the Jews. Not long before he was assassinated in 48, Gandhi called the Holocaust the greatest crime of our time, though still adhered to his core principle of pacifism. That's a hint, so don't. <coughs> the Jews should have offered themselves to the butcher's knife. They should have thrown themselves into the sea from cliffs, he said, according to one of his biographies. It would have aroused the world and the people of Germany. Does anybody believe that? No. 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 <laughs> this is why Ecclesiastes says there's a time for war. They're, they're really bad guys out there. They really are, and, and the tanks won't run on windmills. We gotta have gasoline, etc. Proclaim on the nation, prepare for war, rouse the warriors, let all the fighting men draw near and attack. What has happened to NATO? Now, these are my questions. Are they still so dependent upon us protecting Europe? We took the second fleet, uh, was it the sixth fleet out of the Mediterranean, and now nobody can guard their shores, and you know, when. NATO is totally ineffective to me. And, uh, I hope somebody, they, this is a very smart crowd, and I'll be, a lot of what I say is really, really good, and some of it's nonsense, and I don't know which, which <laughs> area it is, so you have to determine that. But I think NATO has been absolutely worthless with this. Now, this is a great, Camus, this is, I think, one of the best things here with the that idealism quickly mutates to a cult of death. And now, you remember Cates so <laughs> always ended his speeches with coffee must be destroyed. But you can see Christianity, crusades, seas of Jerusalem, you can see that mutate to a cult of death. Hegel, Nietzsche, Hitler, people who are uh, not Aryan aren't good. And that goes to Auschwitz. Hegel, Marx, Lenin, Bakunin, Stalin, Gulag. In Marx, if you read Marx, it's, it's a lot of it's really nonsense. And 
read it. Because he's just wrong about a lot of stuff. It, it depends on me caring as much about it as I'm wrong. Thinking as I do about me. And that <laughs> if there's just one Cadillac out there, I want one. And that's why Marx comes apart. And Freud said that, that the bulk of the libido remains forever narcissistically expected. That's just the way we are. It's, it's survival. It's that Neanderthal that came out of the cave. Muhammad, the Koran, death to Israel, ISIS. And you can hear that shift. That was from Mother Muslim Brotherhood. Interesting, Katab said something that they wrote the, in the shade of the Quran, which became ISIS. He said, the West lacked the ruthlessness to preserve its ideals, freedom of speech. And I wonder now, you can't help but wonder, we are terrified that, that uh, Putin has said uh, we're going to use nuclear. How many, I, will, I won't say, but how many of those deep boomers do we have? We've got such a superiority with nuclear weapons. And we missed the, ter the Soviet Union terribly because they were not, they were good. They wanted to live, and we wanted to live, and we had mutually assured destruction, and we were straight with one another. And this church, I won't say it, but was known as the CIA church at one time. <laughs> but there was kind of a gentleman's agreement between the KGB and the CIA that if they needed to know something that was dangerous, we'd kind of talk to one another about it. We wouldn't kill one another. They could kill their own people, we could kill ours. So put them in prison. But there was a gentleman's agreement and it was a much safer place than the old Soviet Union used to be. Here, and here, where this magical thing came from, of democracy, nation building, death to Hussein and Gaddafi. Let me go on with this a little bit. This is our town. Then, and I, I encourage you to, to read these two books. They're just wonderful. Most of the rural, the way it's designed right now, was made within a circle of about two miles. Graham, Catherine Graham's house right up the street on Long Street, it's fair to say that more political decisions get made in Georgetown suffers than anywhere else in the nation's capital, including the Oval Office. <laughs> and dinner at Joe Alt, the parties in Georgetown are not really parties, they're a form of government by invitation. <laughs> these are the guys, and this one is a slide that you'll hate seeing, but these are the folks in. Frank and Polly Wisner, um, John Kennedy. It, it is said that, and I'll tell this story because it's in there, that, that we got into, Viet, that in, into uh, Vietnam because Phil Graham, in drunkenly, who ran the Washington Post, was screaming at the French ambassador that they were screwing up the war and we could do it well. Now, whether that is true or not, but we have been too vocal. Too many times. But you can see these guys also, uh, Chip Bolin, and uh, we can talk a little bit about what they did. Uh, and they were all brave guys. Frank was reporting out these guys were in World War II. They were bailing out behind the lines, um, and they got back, and uh, most of them went back. James Jesus, I'm with the CIA intelligence, fascinating guy. But, but brave men, and they were trying to do the right thing, and there was a lot of grandiosity. We had just won World War, World War II, and they made some terrible decisions. These are just some of them. George Stevenson said there's no coexistence. That's what got us into Vietnam. Stand up, Steve. <laughs> Steve, Steve. Steve went to the Mekong Delta and had one of those ships and didn't have a film crew with him like John Kerry did. So. <laughs> Great guy. Chip Bolden, the Yalta Conference where uh, Roosevelt was weak and we gave away Eastern Europe. Alan Dulles, the CIA protocol. Frank Wisner, he, he was University of Virginia. He's creative, kind of a wild man. Overthrew the elected leader of Iran, which came back to bite us when the, they took over our embassy. Bay of Pigs fiasco overthrew the elected leader of Guatemala, 
was quite close to Kim Philby. Uh, that's another talk another time. Tracy Barnes, the Bay of Pigs. And, but some good things came out of it. This April Kimmel, the Marshall Plan, you know, our best friends, well, are still Japan, and it used to be Germany before they started buying all their energy from, from uh, but Paul Dinsky's new nuclear test ban treaty <coughs> is being negotiated now in Iran. I'm not so sure that's gonna work out, but we'll let that go. Surely you need guidance to wage war and victory is won through many advisors. Plans are established by seeking advice and I don't think we've done that enough. I've served through five wars, one of which I think Kuwait was the right one. The rest of them, every country we got into, we left in worse shape. Failure to seek advice, Vietnam, Gulf War II, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya. This is a picture of the Kaiser Pass. I don't know what a victory in Afghanistan looks like. But that's what Afghanistan looks like. The, as I said, the Western literature begins with the Iliad and the rage of Achilles, and here he is dragging Hector behind his chariot. Our first vi visions of what was going on in Iraq was what? Here's Hector. Nothing's changed. Now, th this is T of the desert, okay? This guy was, uh, I won't go into it, but it's a scary night. But while he was in power, Libya was doing okay. And then this happens to him and the hanging of Hussein. We were in Paris. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> The only station on was what, CNN, I don't know, not, but my wife was the only one in the room, and they kept showing the hanging of Hussein. Well, what does that do to these guys? What, why did this guy use gas? I'm not sure he did. He's an ophthalmologist. I liked him very well. He didn't, uh, he didn't, well, I don't want to say some other time. <coughs> this guy, I don't think, was afraid of anything. This guy is. Yes. But they look at this and see this is the end. And you think Putin isn't looking at that? That that's what happens? And we're calling for regime change? Not good. So we, some of our leaders have need to rethink some things. I believe it was President Bush that said, bring them on. Guess what? They'll come. And was it Obama that said that the ISIS was the JD? They're not. And leaders need to be very careful with their language. And I think that that's, that doesn't help. If Putin looks at this and sees this is his end, he's a cornered, fearful dictator, quite capable, I think, of using things to, well, he doesn't use it here. I want to, well, we're okay. Uh, or any questions or comments? I, because I want to leave a little time toward the end. Are, are we going too fast, too slow? Okay. Everybody's got their hero. This one's mine. It's James Forrestal. He uh, went to Princeton, dropped out of Princeton, ended up in, on Wall Street, and Dylan, Dylan Reed is the chairman of Dylan Reed. Uh, he made about six million dollars in 1929, which I think says a lot about it. Most people didn't make six million dollars in 29. That's the ship that's named for him, the USS Forrestal. There are three books about him, and I, I'm talking about him because he lived right down here in the Secretary of the Navy's house, right overlooking the industry. He was a Georgetown guy. He and Harry Truman, they played poker every Tuesday night. There are three books about him. The Great Gatsby, From the Terrace, and Magic Man are all fiction of his life. What he could do in World War II, because he had been chairman of Dillon Reed and sold bonds and loaned to Kaiser and loaned to Ford, he got it to where we could put out a B-17 24 in 16 hours, if you can imagine that. 
24B17, in B24, one per hour of the Willow Road. The liver, Kaiser liver ships, three per day when it was taken 180 days. This is what won the war. This is what always been the war. It's getting the materials and the, and the machine fit. And Forrestal could do it because he had personal relationship and, there, and he called in Marker. So everybody owed him something. I mentioned him because he had, and you hear this, that about the Nazis in Ukraine. And I just want to tell this story about him because it's true. He was a very smart guy. He, at the end of the war, he really kind of lost his way, was drinking excessively, became suicidal, tried to jump out of the limousine on the way to the Naval Hospital. We admitted him up there. And um, the president, President Truman, called down and said, where's my Secretary of War? And uh, the guy who had my job, Captain Rain, said, well, he's Mr. President, he's down in the safe ward, in the psych ward, and he's safe down there. And President Truman said, I don't want my Secretary of War down there with those crazy people. <laughs> you move him up to the presidential suite. And Rains, to his credit, wrote a letter, of a memo, a memorandum, and said, I don't want to do it. But he said, well, you put somebody up there to watch him, and sure enough, they did. They put a corpsman up there to watch him that Forrest all liked. Um, and as Corman well, he went AWOL on Sunday night. This book was opened, Sophocles Ajax, and I want to just point out, of the Lone Bird, the Querulous Nightingale, Forrest Hall had underlined that right before he jumped out of the presidential suite, right up there, down to there. The highest ranking. Why Nightingale? He had funded and been in charge of a secret operation using Nazi officers to kill Soviets after World War II in the Ukraine. And it was called Operation Nightingale. What I'm saying is these guys, and I love them, but boy, did they get their tentacles out everywhere. And if you want to, um, it's, it's very exciting to, to read about it. There's some wonderful books about war right now that have come out. I just put these three up. As Jody Bear said, it's deja vu all over again, and it sure is. Pat, Patton said that the, the most magnificent confidence in which a human being can indulge, it brings out all that is best, it removes all that is base. You know, he, he argued, and I don't know if you've seen that, when, when we met the Russians in Berlin, Patton said, let's fight them, we've already got the army here, we're going to have to fight them sooner or later. Was that the right thing to do? I don't know, but it was an idea. It's the same as when, uh, MacArthur looked across that Yalo River in Korea and he saw the ground moving and he saw it wasn't ground, it was the Chinese army. And they swept all the way down the peninsula and we pushed them all the way back. Probably the most successful and only successful United Nations operation, I think. But he wanted to use tactical nuclear weapons then. What Putin's talking about now, we had them then. Would it have been better? I don't know. But these are decisions that go back. You're going to have to fight them sooner or later. And I, right now, we're, and I've talked to my naval attaches, you know, the whole of defense of the Navy of the United States has been knowledge and sea power. It's on that base that the, the country that rules the way call, makes the shots. We call the shots. And, uh, roommate had the Wisconsin and he called the shots on that. But when we lose that, we lose the power to make decisions. Given up by my value system, the Suez Canal was wrong. Uh, given up the Panama Canal, uh, when, we, when we treated, um, I was at the Naval Hospital Long Beach, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, but in the year that I was there, we treated the second man on the moon, the first lady, and the first brother. 
Billy Carter. And when we had Billy in treatment, my boss, Captain Hirsch, went back to the White House. And he and I was so excited to ask him about what, what's the president, what like, what's the president like. And the president is a graduate of our school, the Naval Academy. And Captain Hirsch said to me, he's wonderful. He's authentic. And he's far too decent to be president of the United States. <laughs> he gave away the Panama Canal. Who owns, who controls the Panama Canal? Chinese com com companies run both ends of it. You can't, you can't do that unless somebody is going to rule the world. I like it when we do. <laughs> There's something exciting about that, though. It's just any way you look at it. Errol Santos are here. One of the things that's so alluring by war, and we don't like to admit this deep down inside, but uh, there is an erotic conflict, uh, an erotic concept that comes up with war that's so intense. In the great films, if you look, Gone with the Wind, uh, Casablanca, uh, Deer Hunter, that's one of the greatest scenes to me and all that's my favorite film because it's his character development. He goes from a selfish bartender to altruism to giving up his passage. And it's real character development if you get to go back and watch this, this film. But uh, to me, that's one of the most romantic pictures in all the world. I'll say this about this, does anybody recognize this? Is this you sure these guys do? It's the Comfort. It's a San Clemente class super tanker. Um, we prepared for war. It's got 16 operating rooms on it. And you can land the helicopter with a 12 on And we sent it out to the Gulf War and to take casualties. And as it turned out, as you know, uh, many of the Iraqi Special Forces surrendered to news crews. We didn't have the casualties that were anticipated. What was interesting is the Navy puts uh, 3,000 18 to 25 year old men and women on this ship. And they say Navy regulations where you can't have anything to do with one another. You can't have anything. Guess what? <laughs> 12 to 15 percent of the women came back pregnant. And the Navy says, oh my goodness, they weren't following me. 18 year olds are going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> These were very popular places. It's <laughs> <laughs> not a good and evil issue, it's just what happens. When, and particularly when death is, is underneath. I, I gave a paper in in uh, Las Vegas at the Society for Critical Care Medicine because it was my observation that when the death rate went up in the intensive care unit, the sexual erotic feelings went up in the staff. And I took a survey and sure enough, it happens because it's the way that God replenishes the world. and she couldn't recognize him when he came back. This is, Eric, we, we try to say that, the, I said earlier that one of the things that war and our spiritual life does is it mitigates against loneliness. It's a way to look at death that we can come, become comfortable with, and particularly war, because you, there's a reason to die. And the third is it gives you meaning to preserve our democracy. This is from uh, Edward Maria remark, anger against the whole world, and this is the way our kids come back. Living here so cocksure of their knickknacks as though monstrous years had never been. And one thing matters, life or death, and beyond that, nothing. You remember, I don't know if you, I just want to put up a couple of films. This is a great film. It, it really should be seen because it's a story of post-traumatic stress disorder. This film did not get a lot of press, but it's probably the best one about meaningless. Yes, I can't read this. And there again, I like to put this up. 
when I give a talk at the Army War College that we call out. And because we did generals, and I asked what a victory exactly looks like in the Kyber Pass. Because if they'll tell me, I'll tell them that's in Washington. <coughs> Post traumatic stress disorder, I just wanted to cover it briefly. Loss of a part of your mental function, persistent mobilization of the body and mind for lethal danger. That's kind of come now with COVID. You're, you're, we're kind of afraid of one another. Persistence and activation of combat survival skills and civilian life. Persistent expectation of betrayal and exploitation. You see people getting in planes over masks on planes now. Destruction of the capacity for trust. Vets are painfully aware of the absence of intimacy, tenderness, and light playfulness for the easy mutuality of their sexual life. We're going to talk another time later. What we do to recover, and I, I think that this is the most important thing, and, and I have loved taking care of PTSD because I got some of it. And, and uh, if we don't rediscover the awe and wonder and gratitude and humor, joy, play, and become psychologically pliable, we don't do well. This, do you remember this famous Marine, Chester Puller's son? I ain't no fortunate son. He didn't have to go to Vietnam, but he did. And Lewis didn't make it, he took his life and his PTSD, but I loved him, and I got to know him pretty well. You remember this guy, Max? Everybody, almost everybody knows Max. Max took this from, from Hemingway, Pharaoh alone. The world breaks everyone, and afterward many are strong in the broken places, but those it will not break, it kills. It kills the very good, and the very gentle, and the very brave, and partially. Max was a joy, and there's a number of guys in this room that spend a lot of time. But Max taught me more about PTSD and recovery than anybody I knew. He was up in Quezon trying to rescue his old Marine, got off of a helicopter and grabbed a uh, hand grenade and lost both of his legs and his right arm. He only hurt himself. But uh, Max was one of the funniest, most joyous guys that you could ever know. And I don't think psychotherapy gets much more than what Thomas Wolfe says in You Can't Go Home Again. This is a man who, if he can remember 10 golden moments of joy and happiness after all his years, 10 moments, unmarked by care, unseen by aches or riches, has the power to lift himself with his expiring breath and say, I've lived upon this earth and known the Lord. I just love that. This is Behind the Lines. It's a film about secondary trauma, which our culture is now absorbing now. A lot of, we've lost more people from COVID than we lost in World War II. We've lost more people from fentanyl than we lost in World War II. We've lost more people, and I think, Forgive me for saying this, I think the most successful biological and chemical warfare in the history of man has been carried out. The fentanyl comes through Sonoma and it comes across our southern border. And to not say that, I think it would be a mess. Now this, I'm gonna wind up here. I love this. Though much is taken, much abides, and though we are not that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are, one equal temper, heroic hearts, made weak by time and pain, but strong in will, to strive to seek, to find, and not to yield. And I kind of think that's where our country is. We're not what we were when we had 10,000 ships. We got 350 now. It's a difference. I'm not gonna go into this, but this is what got the Navy into treatment for alcoholism. This was the fire aboard the, aboard the USS Forrestal when it was on station in Vietnam. We nearly lost the ship. Aside when the missile went off, 
We lost five five hundred pound model. We nearly lost a man of war at war and having received an enemy shot. We screened the deck for drugs, and thirty five percent were positive for opiates, marijuana, alcohol. At that point in time, the Navy got very interested in having solar people uh, handle side harming missiles, and that's where we had a zero tolerance, and that became this is. McCain's mind got right there. They don't know that it was his. I had an emotional attack and I had one possible friend in Pensacola. That was his swing at me. I want to help him. As Lloyd McCauley again, the essence of war is violence. The problem, the, the thing that is so alluring about war is it gives us meaning and it gives us a hero's journey. It makes relationships intense. It gives us something to work. And it, I think, beats the heck out of philosophical materialism, which we're kind of down to anchor. The spiritual journey that comes out of it is just spectacular, I think. And Freud said that mental health was work and love, and I've added to that that you gotta learn to play too, because it, work and love just isn't enough. Jung said that Mental health is the capacity to hold opposites in the head at the same time. And we can really do that now with this war. We have to, I think, to maintain any sanity. This is the upside of PTSD. Uh, but there's a great article called post traumatic Stress, Surprisingly Positive Flip Side. And I think this whole country is traumatized now by COVID. And it does have a flip side. This is the guys from the Hanoi Healthy because they were admitted at San Diego when I was a medicine resident. They had a stronger religious conviction. They enjoyed life more, appreciated others more, loved more, laughed more. And the paradox, and this is not one you want to know, the worse the abuse, the better the outcome. <coughs> And Burke said, for me, people are warring the time of their lives. It is the acts of attraction so appalling and exhilarating. And I want to introduce this and close with this. This is Sir Adrian Corbin of New York. Um, probably the father of Tim has heard of him. Or Victoria Cross, I think that ninth of the British Empire. I don't know, distinguished service. I don't know any decoration he missed, and probably Tim would know. Uh, he was in the Boer War, World War I, World War II. Sir Adrian was a British Army officer, so was shot in the face, head, stomach, ankle, leg, hip, and ear, survived two plane crashes, tunneled out of a POW camp, bit off with both fingers when the doctor refused to amputate it. Describing his experience in the war, surprisingly, I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to know guys like that. <laughs> He's a handy guy. I just. <laughs> and here are from Tennyson's Ulysses I cannot rest from trouble. I will drink life to the leaves. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that love me and alone on shore. It is not too late to seek a newer world, push off, and for my purpose, hold to sail beyond the sunset and the bath of all the western stars until I die. I think we've got a chance now to really learn from this. And Putin's been able to do something nobody else has done. He's kind of united the world. He's not in bad. I'm going to quit now. I'm tired of this. Are there any questions, comments? Thank you very much. I mean, that's terrific. Um, what, are you saying, or would you agree with the notion that that um, that war is inevitable? That it is that it is part and parcel of, of, the, of, the, of the of the human experience? Yes. Yeah, I think I don't think it's going to go away. And, 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 and sure. that Christianity, uh, part of the Christian doctrine, I suppose, is. Uh, while we all want peace, there are times where 
Yeah, I think that that's what God is saying. Yeah. You, you can't jump over the cliff because Hitler likes that. Yeah. And he ain't going to change. Yeah. And you could argue the same thing with Putin now. I think. Yeah. You know, the, the, the most touching part of war was World War I. And you look it up when the Germans and the Brits, and that was the worst. They, they, you know, there was 100,000 men for a mile each way. On Christmas Eve, they put their guns down and went out and exchanged sausages and sang hymns together. We can do that. That's still within us. And it's within the Ukrainians and the Russians, and that's what the AA community in Kiev was saying. We can do it, but we can't stop from killing each other. Not yet. You know, you see all these movies where the horrible is being insane, and then look at what's going on. You speak up, and that, and that, that is the essential nature of human, which you've articulated here, is that we have within all of us a beast. Yes. And that beast is a killer, and when you read that book, when you read that book, uh, Sapiens, it is why the Homo sapiens species came to dominate the world. It's the inherent in all of us is a viciousness. And you can see when you talk about what happened in World War I, where there was a pause on the battlefield, that came from individuals. It didn't come from leaders. No. Because the leaders were shooting people who wouldn't run in face and shoot them in the back if they wouldn't run in to face a uh, machine gun. So you know, part of the problem is uh, the fact that on an individual basis, you can set aside and you can focus on love and, and care. But when you put in, and that's where we talk about it, Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, and that's why a Putin can go against and lead a whole nation in a war that most of the people don't want. And, and we're never going to rot out evil, and the, the strongest, most evil people tend to become our leaders. But, and that's a, that's a tragedy, but it's, it's, that's why the Greeks had Greek tragedy. Life is tragedy. <laughs> But it's also wonderful when we, we, if you sit and talk to these guys, I traveled with Arlen Specter for uh, 22 years. He was the only Republican Jew and he was the highest terrorist target. And, and he liked to talk to bad guys. That's the way we got with Gaddafi and Arafat and all that. But what I learned from him is if you sit and talk to one another long enough, you know, there's a natural love that comes out. Even at Panmunjom, the South Koreans and the North Koreans begin to care about one another. And that is stronger than that wish to kill one another, I think. And the talking, keep talking, keep talking. Let's quit. Thank y'all.